Hello there fellow data scientist, algo trader, or just curious person. If you're interested in making money in the markets, you've come to the right place. My name is Leo and I'm an algorithmic trader. And today we're going to backtest Scotland's slingshot trading setup. If you're not sure who Scotland is, Scotland is a professional trader with multiple triple digit returns under his belt, with his highest being 302% and this year clocking at 150%. And I know that's pretty much certain because today's December 31st, 2021, so 150% annualized. If you're not familiar with the setup, I created a Analyzing Alpha TV episode right here. These are just more bite-sized to understand trading and not really dig into the code. If it's related to code and backtesting, data science, AI, all of that stuff, that is this channel. And instead of me digressing, why don't we get to the code? Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is import this. I want to grab some of the custom code that we previously created. And since I'm creating this notebook out of a different directory, I need to append the proper directory to the Python path. So this is how you let Python know where your code modules are. So uh, home, little sniggle, development, okay, I, enter. So now we have access to all those previous code, you know, custom code that we've created. Now let's briefly talk about the Scotland uh, slingshot strategy, uh, mainly in the algorithmic sense, because if you're interested in the slingshot, go ahead and check out um, you know, this video here uh, where I go a little bit more in depth. But anyways, what are we doing? We need to first grab our universe of stocks. Universe is the QQQ. Then we filter uh, the stocks above 50 SMA. And then the entry, uh, let's see, and Okay, filter and a stock well above four EMA of the highs could be hourly or daily. And then the exit is low of the trigger bar. Okay, so that could be hourly or daily also. And then whenever we don't um, date, whether it's the open, high, low, or close, and just it's assumed that it's the close, just so you know, okay? All right, so first things first, we need to get our imports. We'll do get imports, we'll import date time as the T, import numpy as MP, import pandas as PD, from source model.api, import get tickers, and get limit bars. And this just uh, gets us the data out of that database that we've already created. Hit enter, that looks great. We'll now set the time frame. Let's see, uh, let's see. set time frame. And you can obviously back test this for as much as you want, but we'll do 2020-0101. And keep in mind, <laughs> I know that the uh, do two years. Um, I know that QQQ has been on a tear here, so you're going to want to test this stuff over multiple time frames. Uh, but the idea here uh, with the vectorized back test is just get an idea: does this setup work? And uh, you know, it's a pullback setup, so it it does. Let's see here: create universe. So what we'll do here is I'm going to web scrape. Um, you know, just to show you how to web scrape the QQQ from uh, Invesco. So we'll do import CSV, import request. I would recommend in, in the future, if you're you know serious about this stuff, you add this to your database too. I'll say the URL, that's the URL for Invesco. And now I'm just going to copy this code here. I'll briefly cover it, uh, but I don't want to waste your time. Uh, so anyways, we just open up a session and then we get the uh, URL, which is up here, and then we uh, decode it. We split on, you know, the commas. Uh, we couldn't use um, pd.readcsv for pandas, but basically this code essentially downloads, it puts it in a data frame, uh, strips off uh, one of the incorrect, uh, you know, the incorrect header, right, and then adds the header, which is right here. 
And when we hit enter, we now have QQQ for the current date. Now, keep in mind, again, this is the current QQQ, so anything that drops out uh, would not be in our back test. So because we're long, going long, um, essentially there is a little bit of um, survivor bias here. So just something to be uh, aware of. And then also, uh, that's why you want to put this stuff in your database so you can ensure that you have the historical components and of, of the QQQ and not just the existing constituents. Hopefully that makes sense. So now let's just grab the tickers, do DF. Let's see, what does that say? Holding ticker right there. Okay. DF holding ticker. Now we use a string method strip because I know there's some spaces in there that shouldn't be. Sort values just because I like them to be sorted. Do list and then tickers. So there we go. So now we have all of our tickers, which we'll then use to get our bar data. So we're going to do that next. Number one, F, three, four. Okay. One, two, three, four, bar data. Okay. So it'll be bars 1m, get minute bars, stickers, start, end. I'm using Polygon to get my data here. Um, but basically, uh, you can use any source. You know, you don't even necessarily need to use minute data. If you have hourly or daily, you can just test on the, you know, on those time frames. But, um, we're going to use the minute data and then we're going to uh, resample them to get uh, the appropriate time frame. This will take a minute, so I'm going to fast forward in a sec. Now we can see that our bar data is populated with a multi index. The level zero is the ticker, level one is date, and we have open, high, low, close, and volume for the columns. And one of the things that we need to discuss that we didn't have to, I guess, cover in the crypto price year trading video because crypto trades 24 seven on the UTC timeframe or uh, is that the stock market opens up different times of the year relative to UTC, which is the time zone that most of the data is provided in by data providers. And this can cause challenges when we try to resample and align the data properly because the time is different. Let's go ahead and see exactly what I mean. First, we'll go ahead and reset the index. You'll notice now we have uh, ticker and date as columns. Now, I believe the uh, daylight savings time was uh, April 14th. So it'll be bars 1M, bars 1M date, where the date is less than 2021-03-14. And we can see that the stock market opens at 1430 UTC. Now, I'll copy this paste this and let's make it greater than and equal to. Now we can see that the stock market opens at 1330. So 1430, 1330. That would cause uh, some problems in the future. Now one thing that we also can take a look at is when the daylight savings time begins. So we'll do bars 1M date greater than equal to 21, 11, 07. Okay, so that's when it begins, and now we see it's back to 1430. So that's just something that we need to consider. So how do we handle this? Well, what we need to do is we need to convert the time zone before we resample. So let's go ahead and do that now. Do bars 1M, date, equals bars 1M, date, and we use the date time methods, easy, Convert America, New York. Right? And then we can do bars 1M and notice what we see now. Now you can see we have the time zone and Eastern time is five hours behind UTC. Now what we can do is let's go back up to here and grab this and see what we see. And now we see it minus four and just not to flutter everything up, we see minus five. So now we have the correct time zone in place and 
we can merge now on 1930 and that'll align appropriately. Let's go ahead and get everything set up back to the format that we want. And now we'll go ahead and type bars 1m, bars 1m dot set index, asset date and ticker, and I'll put that to the screen. And now we can see that we have the date and the ticker. You'll notice I actually rearranged that, um, and you'll see why in a minute. But basically now we see the time zone has been added to the index here, the level index or the date. So with our dates organized the way that we want them to be, it's now time to create the indicators. Now the reason we create the indicators here is that way we can apply it to them to multiple time frames. Create indicators. We'll say EMA four is equal to lambda x, where x EWM span equals four min periods equal four. Just equals false, ignore NA equals false. Okay, that's pretty simple. Now we'll do EMA 10 equals lambda x. We want we want to make sure that we're in a downtrend, so we want lambda x will be we're going to use this for the daily, so the close is going to be below the 10 period EMA. So min period is 10. Let's do span first, span. 10 min periods and adjust false, ignore NA false. And then the SMA 50 lambda x x dot rolling 50 min. So now these are really the three indicators that I put that up here. Um, filter stocks above their 50. And I'll also do filter where stocks below. And EMA. All right. So and mean, not man. Hit enter. Perfect. Now we go ahead and resample the time frames. Right heading here. First, create a aggregation dictionary. And what that does, it just tells pandas what we need to do with each column, right? Because we're taking minute data and turning that into hourly data. And we need to know, well, what is the open for the, you know, for the hourly bar? So for instance, make this more concrete, open would be the first data point, right? High is the max. Low is the min. Close is the last, and volume is the sum. Now that we have that completed, what we want to do now is create our hourly bar. So we'll say bars 1H equals bars 1M, because we're resampling from the minute bars. We want to group by both the uh, hour time period, right, and also the ticker. So we can use PD grouper level zero, which is the time, and the frequency 1H for one hour. And we're going to use label equals left. Now with that, we don't necessarily need to specify this, but I want to be explicit. If you think about a daily time frame, the it has a period, right? The beginning is the morning or when it, you know the day first ticks over. So that would be at zero minutes. And then the end of the day, would be at you know the last minute or tomorrow exclusive. So that's what that label means. Frequency label. There we go. Because this should be in a list together. So all right, perfect. All right, PD grouper level one. So that is now the ticker, right? And I'll bring this back here, group that. So the group by is all together. So we have the group by, we're passing the list of grouper objects. The first one is level zero, which is the time. And the second one is level one, which is the ticker. And we pass it the dictionary on how to determine, um, you know, the aggregations. 
Yeah, method OK. And or is one eight. Let's also create the indicators at this point. So EMA four is the bars one eight group by because we want to always group by the ticker when performing these operations so we don't accidentally have the let's say Google's four period EMA be calculated from part of Apple price if that makes sense. I and then we want to apply the EMA four function. Now what we'll do is since we already know we're going to have a bunch of uh, null values because you know the EMA4 takes four periods to calculate that first value. We can drop all of the data using a subset EMA4. So this will drop all of the NA values that show up for all of the rows where the NA values show up in the EMA4 period column. Now we'll do bars 1H columns. So we're going to have both hourly and daily bars. We want to make sure we specify or be able to easily determine which bars are which. So we'll just append this or C in bars 1.8 columns. And we'll type bars 1.8 and hit enter. And hopefully this works. And it does. So what we can see now is we see the date uh, by hour, right? And we do see our time zone. It's uh, time zone aware now. And then our ticker and then our hourly values plus the EMA41H. And we should be able to also determine if we have any null values. Maybe there is null sum, and that's good because we did the drop NA up above there. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, and now it's time to create those daily bars. And now instead of retyping everything since I just explained it, I'll just copy and paste as you understand the concepts here. And what we'll do is we need to still modify this because remember, we're going to use the 50 period SMA and the 10 period EMA, right? So we'll do this right here. So first I'll switch everything to daily. So don't forget. Okay, frequency 1D, bars 1D. I know that needs to be changed, 1D. Okay, and now we need to add the appropriate indicators. I'll keep the EMA of the highs, uh, just if you want to check out or test out that version. We'll do EMA 10. This will be the close and the SMA 50, okay, which is the close. And then we need to update this. That's May 50. And we only need to drop the 50 because we know that the 50 takes up more periods than any of the other versions, right? 10, that's 10 period, that's four period, bars 1D. So let's I'm gonna do bars 1H. Okay, just checking to make sure I didn't forget anything there. And then I hit enter, and that should give us our daily bars. It looks like it does. Perfect. And now we'll check to see R is 1B is null, just like we did before, sum. Do we have any null values? And no, we don't. So it looks like we're good there. But there's one challenge here. So if you look at the time frame, right, when does the uh, daily bars open? They start at 9.30 Eastern. So what we need to do is we need to align those. And that's pretty easy to do. So just do Type bars 1D, we'll reset the index, right? So we can access the date. We'll then take the date and we will add an offset, which is hours equals 15, bars 1D, bars 1D, set index. We're just setting the index back. So all we did is we added an offset because we know that the stock market doesn't open at zero hours. It opens later on. And more specifically, you know, this is 15 hours after, you know, the zero here. So which would be the end of the day, because we want to merge the bars on the end of the day, not the open, because think about it. You can't know 
the close of that day, right? The close of the daily bar until the close of that day. So that's why we're um, doing 15 uh, hours. Okay, what did I do here? Bars 1D date, bars not defined. There we go. Okay, so perfect. So now we have the bars which have a timestamp essentially of uh, the close, which is, you know, should line up with the hourly bars, you know, the last hourly bar, which is also 15. So hopefully that, that makes sense. All right, so now that we have the time frames, uh, the both of the bars, you know, the hourly bars and the daily bars, it's time to merge the time frames. First, go ahead and create the heading here. Merge time frames. I think we're on seven. Six, seven, yep. All right, now, uh, one thing I want to show you is how to access the first date. All right, so if we do print bars 1D index, you get that first element, you'll see what this looks like, and we see it's a timestamp, and it has multiple different data within it, but we want the first element, which is that time, right? Now we can go ahead and copy this and paste it three times to get the starting and ending boundary. So this would be the start of the hourly, and negative one would be the end, right? And the hourly. So we hit enter here, and we can see that the data frames are almost aligned. The hourly is um, behind the daily, which makes sense because, right, the SMA daily creates a lot of null values relative to the hourly. Okay, so now what we need to do is simply align these, which is pretty easy. We'll first reset the indices, bars 1H, bars 1H, reset index, bars 1D, bars 1D, reset index. Perfect. And now what we need to do is we'll just slice the uh, hourly bars to remove those, um, you know, anything that uh, doesn't align with the daily. So the bars 1H date where the bars 1D date. Then, okay, so let's take a look and think about what we're doing here. So the bar, the hourly date has to be greater than or equal to the minimum daily date, right? And then this just gets all of the columns. So that should align that. And what I do here, oops, be dot lock. Now what I'll do is I'll just print out the um, start and end dates again. And this time, since we reset the indices, it'll actually, we'll use a different command because we're accessing the column and not the index. So this would be 1H. And this would be negative 1 because we want to get the last element. 1H. And they should all be aligned and that they are. And we have that time zone information too. Perfect. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is just create a bars data frame that merges both the hourly and the daily. So let's say bars equals bars 1H merge. We want to merge with the bars 1D on, and we're going to merge on the date and the ticker, and then how is left. Because we know the hourly will include or is inclusive of all of the daily bars. But the challenge is we're going to have a bunch of null values for the daily. But let's go ahead and um, fix that. And we'll do that by filling them. So bars 1D columns. So we're going to grab the daily columns. We're going to group by the ticker. And then we'll apply this to the daily columns. We're going to transform them. Lambda x, x, forward fill. Hard to see the two F's there. Okay, and then we just set everything back. Bars, set index, date, ticker, and bars. And now we see that it is indeed looking like it's working. We've got all of our column headings up here with our different uh, moving averages, and everything should be 
filled, uh, but let's verify that. We can do that by typing bar swap level one zero. So we're swapping the uh, indices, right? So we're getting the ticker first and we're taking a cross section, grab the Apple ticker is null and sum to see if there are any null values and there shouldn't be, and we are good. So now we're on to the next step, which is creating the signals. Create a title here, do create signal. Okay, and now let's go ahead and create that. We'll do bars entry signal equals, and then we've got a few uh, different things we have to consider here. So first we want strong stocks in an uptrend, and we define that as being above the close price, being above the 50-day simple moving average. So close 1D is greater than bars SMA 50 1D. And then we want stocks that are in a temporary, hopefully, a downtrend. Bars close 1D. Bars EMA 10 1D. There's all sorts of stuff you could do with that. You could look at uh, range compression and stuff like that using ATR. But anyways, again, we're just covering the slingshot here with, the, with these basic um, parameters. So now that we have strong stocks in uptrend with a slight pullback, now we, what we want to do is we want to get that slingshot entry where the hourly close is above the four hour EMA crossover. And the crossover is key. I'll show you why in a second. So we got bars close one hour is greater than bars EMA for one hour. And we want bars uh, group by thicker. And we have to group. So basically, we want to make sure that this right here, right, did not occur on the prior bar. So we have to group by the ticker to make sure that we're not accidentally mixing tickers when calculating EMAs. So EM, uh, close 1H, shift. Again, it's just the same thing as the above, but we're just shifting uh, the data by one. And then bars group by ticker. And now it's the EMA for one hour, shift, perfect. And hopefully I didn't make any typos there. And hit enter and see if that does create the signal. And it does appear that it may have, but we see only false data. So what we want to do now is let's go ahead and determine if there is indeed any entries. So we didn't make a potential mistake there. So entry signal is equal to true. And it does look like we did get some trues over there. And let's see here. So we've got Zoom. I think it's Gilead, Pfizer. Uh, let's see here. So let's take this one right here. And you'll see why. Because what I want to do is just take a look at these signals. So we'll do bars swap level one zero dot XS. And then GILD, right? So that'll just pull, uh, you know, the Gilead uh, data. And then we want to select a time frame. And we can do that using slicing because level zero is the time data. So 2020, 20, 0, 3, 14. And now I want to go back one hour earlier. Uh, whoops. Slicing. Okay, and now what we can see when we go to the entry signal, we have a false, right? We want to make sure we get one before then and then true and then false. So we're making sure that the crossover works. Okay, and now it's time to analyze the results. The heading, analyze the results. And let me kind of go at a high level of what we're going to do here. I mean, there's obviously more sophisticated ways to do this. I, you know, for every demonstration, what I want to do is kind of focus on a key part, right? In this video, it really was, you know, understanding how to align the time frames and merge and whatnot for equities because that's pretty important, even though it's not used in crypto. You know, I know there's more sophisticated ways to do what we're about to do, um, and we're going to just be looping through things to make it easy. <laughs> but um, I just don't want these things to drag on because you know it's already getting pretty long. So, anyways, I'm digressing, but. I just want to let you know there's better ways to do this um, and different things that we can analyze. But all we're going to do is we're going to loop through 10 times for each risk reward ratio, 1 through 10. 
Okay. In fact, I'll I'll just type this in right here. So we'll do list. Con we'll use list comprehension. R four R in range one to eleven. So one to ten. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a dictionary called stats and then inside that we'll have another dictionary uh, where we kind of keep all those stats and we're just going to loop through each ticker and then for each ticker we're going to loop through each bar. Now the important thing to understand when we're doing this is that we have to get this signal on the one bar right and then take the trade on the next bar. You can't take a trade on the same bar that you get your signal. That would be uh, looking ahead or look ahead bias. And you'd see some great results, but whenever you tried to put this in your event-driven backtester or try to live trade it, your results wouldn't be nearly as good. So, anyways, so we'll first create that, you know, an apparent dictionary for J N R R R. So it just loops this through ten times. We'll create a list for our trades. Okay, and now there's a few variables that we want to uh, keep track of, or we'll keep track of. The maximum one, like the, basically a win counter and a loss counter. Okay, and now what we'll do is we'll just simply loop through each ticker. So for ticker in bars, group by level one, right? And we're grouping by level one because that is our ticker. So, okay. So this will give us the data for each um, for each ticker. We'll say risk reward is J, so it'll start off at one, two, three, four, five. You get the idea. We just want to count the number of wins, the number of losses, the number of consecutive wins, and consecutive lost. Okay, and we'll also say position equals false, and take position. These are just flags that we're we're going to use, right? Um, to track things. So now that we have the data for each ticker, we want to loop through each bar. So for I, R, and data, it arose. If take position, remember, um, we're going to put the signal, actually, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, no, no, okay. So remember, the signal is going to happen at the end of the loop. So if take position equals true, right? Now, what do we want to do if we want to take position, right? We want to set our entry price, which will be at the open. We want to set our risk, and then we want to say position is true and take position is false, right? Because we've already taken the position. So the entry price is equal to the open, because we're using the hourly bars, right? And this would likely be the, the close of the prior bar, but you get the idea. And now what we want to do is set our entry risk. So ENTRY risk is equal to the entry price minus the stop price. Right? Pretty simple stuff. And you'll see the stop price will be set uh, on the, the last portion of this loop. And now since we've taken a position, position is equal to true, and we don't want to take a position on the next one because we'll already have a position, so it'll be false. Okay. But now... What we want to do is we want to handle when we have a position if we're going to stop out or take profit. So that's all we're doing next. We'll do if position equal to true. And then if our close one hour is less than the stop price, right, we lost. So we'll add to our loss counter. We'll add to our consecutive loss counter. And we'll say the max one, because now if we had a well, winning streak, we want to track that. So max one is equal to max one. If max one is greater than consecutive one, else consecutive one, right? So basically what we're doing here is we're saying, well, max one is equal to our prior max one unless our now consecutive one is greater. So hopefully that makes sense. And now we have to zero this out. Well, zero and then position equals false. Now this handles our stop out. Now the only other side of this, if condition, else if the close, the, the preferable <laughs> portion, the close of the one hour is greater than our entry price plus our entry risk times our risk reward, right? So now if that's the case, and let me scroll down here, what we want to do is we essentially do the same as we just as above, we add to our one column, we 
create or add another to our consecutive one. We then set our max lost is equal to max loss. If max loss is greater than consecutive lost, else consecutive lost. Okay, and now what we need to do, again, just like above, consecutive loss is equal to zero, and position is equal to false. So now we need to do our entry signal, right? So if entry signal is equal equal to true, right? That's part of our data frame, and position is equal equal to false, we want to take position is equal to true. So that's our take position flag. And then stop price low on H. And that gives us our stop price and our take position uh, entry, which will then get caught on the next bar, assuming there is one. And now we'll just close it all out. Position is false, max one, max one, if max one is greater than consecutive one else consecutive one, max loss is equal to max loss if max loss is greater than consecutive loss, else consecutive loss. And now we want to append all the data, the trades append, we'll just make a list, ticker one lost. Perfect. And now for every risk reward level, right, because this is just for, the, you know, that risk reward level. So we want to track that. So we'll do stats J for each risk reward level. We'll create another dictionary. So we'll have NIST dictionaries, stats J, trade equal to trades, stats J, win streak equal to max one, stats J, lose streak. Go to max lost, perfect. And now what we need to do, we'll just I'll put that on this line here and see how many errors I made. <laughs> position, I misspelled this, position is not defined, 23. Yep. Okay, and then this will go ahead and loop through this 10 times and do all this logic and hopefully we'll have a nice dictionary that we can then uh, convert to a data frame and analyze. Okay, now that looks like that populated. You can see the uh, data output here. So, you know, the risk reward ratio is the key. And then you have all the data with that nested dictionary, lots of data. So I'm just going to scroll down here. Obviously, this isn't in the best format, right? Um, so let's go ahead and make it a little bit easier to read. So we'll do that by creating a data frame. So we'll do data equals PD data frame, and then for key value in stats items, we'll say DF equals PD data frame, take the value for trade, and then we'll say DF with reward is equal to K, which is another key, and then DF win streak is equal to win streak. And what we're going to aggregate this in a little bit. So you'll see what I'm doing here. It makes it might be like, why are you just copying this over um, making the whole column that but you'll see what I'm doing. Blue streak. And then let's just name the columns DF columns, we should have picker, one, lost, risk reward, win streak, and blue streak. And data equal data dot append. So we're just appending the DF that we you know loop through for each risk reward level. And now by data here, that should make it easier to see. So now we have um, each ticker, number of one wins, number of losses, you know, which risk reward level was it, the win streak, the lose streak. So this is great, but likely you're going to want to get the aggregate statistics, right? So let's go ahead and create uh, some summary stats. Do some stats equal data group by. We want to group by the risk reward. So aggregate this. We will want the one will be summed, right? Then we want the lost summed. And then the win streak, it really doesn't matter, right? So we'll do 
win streak. We'll just say first. And then for fun, we'll just make the next one win streak. Uh, blue streak last. Okay. And now what we'll do is we'll say sum stats total is equal to the sum stats one plus some stats loss. So now we'll have the total trades and what else do we want? Let's get the uh, win percentage. So some stats win, first we'll call it, is equal to some stats one divided by some stats total. And some stats is equal to some stats dot reset index. And now we got some stats. And now we have each risk reward level grouped together, have the total one, total loss, win streak, lose streak, and win percentage, right? So now we're getting somewhere. So let's go ahead and now add edge, right? Um, so we'll say some stats edge is equal to some stats win perk times some stats risk reward minus one minus some stats win perk, right? So this is just the the losing ratio and this for fun we'll just say times one. Because if you think about it, um, a risk reward level or risk reward ratio is always a you know one risk to how much reward. So we're just going to multiply by one here. I never take a profit less than uh, the risk, right? Um, so one is fine here. So one is pegged. Hopefully that makes sense. And now what we'll do is we'll just hit, uh, we'll actually, some stats, hit enter here. And now we have our edge, right? So basically what we're doing is every time we flip a coin or enter a trade, this is the expected. So you might say, well, wow, Leo, the edge is really great up here. We should just, uh, you know, set our risk reward levels to uh, 10. Well, you also have to keep in mind this losing streak. So you have to do some a little bit more advanced math to determine what, uh, you know, your risk tolerance and whatnot. And again, one thing to keep in mind here, this is a very, whenever you're prototyping this stuff, and this is what I call prototyping when we're using a vectorized backtesting system instead of an event-driven. Event-driven loops through every single bar, doesn't have look-ahead bias, and you can model things more in depth. Maybe I'll create, actually, I will create a video on uh, vectorized versus event-driven backtesting. But basically with pandas and Python, the goal is to get an understanding whether or not this setup works, and it does indeed look like it does. And we made this uh, entry signal pretty, not naive, but if you look at um, the video, on the slingshot, you can understand there's also, we want rain compression and other stuff too. So we could potentially do a range break using highs and lows uh, pivot points. So there's all sorts more stuff that we can do. But this is this goal of the video was to get a basic understanding of whether this pullback strategy works and it does have an edge. Uh, but at this point, you would want to model this further. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully you enjoyed this video.